started. Um, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I, every, I think everybody pretty much knows me. Uh, uh, but today I'm going to just talk about something that I've really gotten into lately uh, uh, and I'm really excited about it, so I want to kind of share this excitement and get a few people else keen for it. Uh, just to talk about me, I think... Oh, oh wait. just a button or anything? Oh, no, no, you just door. open the door. Okay. We'll wait for that person. Lucky you for the box. Yeah. <laughs> If I get another beep in the next 30 seconds, I'm just going to wait for five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my, story, my story is a fairly common one. Uh, I write JSON to SQL interpreters for a living. I'm fairly good at it, but uh, I frequently get sad at the horrible trade-offs that we're kind of forced to deal with when interacting with relational DBs uh, in our code. Uh, and I kind of started off Java developer, doing raw JDBC. It worked. Yeah, and all of SQL, that's pretty awesome. But you quickly repeat yourself a lot, uh, and that's not so awesome. Uh, and then you start doing crazy stuff, like you start breaking them up into little strings and then gluing them together yourself, and then bad things happen. You don't want to do that. Uh, so then I moved on to Spring. Uh, so it was five years ago now. That was fun, but... Uh, I'm, I think I'm permanently traumatized from that experience. Uh, sorry if there's any JPA devs here. Uh, but to, for, my, for my head, especially where it is now, there's really too much focus on the object side. And a lot of the SQLness kind of gets lost in that. Um, and even so, the, the queries are either these ginormous, disgusting Java objects, or you're still dealing with strings that are really hard to abstract and compose on. Uh, it had a lot of merit, it was cool, I really enjoyed parts of JPA, but yeah, it just lost some awesome parts, and I kind of moved on. And I moved on to Perl, of all things. I took a really lovely ORM called DBX class. It's definitely my favorite ORM out of any dynamic language, or pretty much anything that calls itself an ORM, it's my favorite. Uh, and you can, you can build all these little bits of query and compose them together, and it's really awesome, you can layer them, and do lots of nice things of joining, joining, and joining, and making this big query that eventually works. But sometimes it doesn't work, because the queries were just these weird incantations of strings and hashes, and you could get them wrong, or the syntax was completely undocumented, and lots of different things like that. It just made them kind of painful to deal with, but still composable. Composable's great. Um, and yes, it was easy to mess up. And it was still OO, uh, so it still kind of felt like we lost some SQL on this that got missing along the wayside to make the OO stuff happen. So then I tried Slick 1.0 in Scala. And that, that made me really excited because it, it felt like SQL. It had this nice Scala syntax. And it kind of offered this prospect of having these little composable SQL bits that you could glue together and glue together in a fairly safe way. But the DSL types are really complicated. Some errors that you got, I just couldn't understand them. And it was, it felt like, it felt like you really had to understand the innards of the DSL to really understand it and get it. Uh, and it just it felt like too much work for the payoff. Uh, and sometimes like we had to slick what it was complicated to the point where we had a slick 1.0 app that was actually seg faulting the JVM intermittently in the query optimizer or something. And it happened fairly regularly, like once a week. Uh, uh, didn't want to figure that out. Uh, and you could still, in all that complication, you could still generate bad SQL at runtime pretty easily, which is pretty sad. And I had a pretty similar experience with Haskell DB. It forced you to understand bits that you really didn't want to have to think about. Uh, and the innards were complicated and a bit weird. And you could still generate bad SQL. And I kind of got to this point where I'm like, is, is SQL too crazy to model in a nice type safe way that we can compose? Uh, and I got really sad. And I just said yes, and I went back to raw SQL. I was this old, cranky developer that was just like, no, we do raw queries, and that's the only way that it works, because everything else sucks. Uh, and I was like that for a while. Uh, Sean's not here. He convinced me otherwise, which is a good thing. Because uh, I just I couldn't help, I couldn't get happy about removing all the nice SQLness. Uh, and I couldn't deal with 
non-safe composition either. And I can't deal with composition that I can't reason about or prove that it's correct, because that's not really composition. It's kind of gluing things together and hoping it works. Uh, so that made me really sad. But then recently, I found Overlay. Overlay is an embedded Haskell DSL for generating SQL. So it's just normal Haskell. It generates SQL. It's not an ORM, which is great. Uh, it's Postgres only, which is good and bad. I only use Postgres, so that's great for me. I don't really mind. Uh, it's relatively new. It got released to Hackage about a year ago, 1st of December. So it's still, it's not all there yet. There's still bits that you'll find features that aren't there. But Tom's very, uh, uh, he's very eager to make those missing features happen. So if there's something missing, you can either do it yourself, because it's actually kind of easy, or, or you can ask him to do it, uh, and very receptive to those kind of things. Uh, and it's now up to 0.4.1. Uh, it focus on, focuses on having very fine grain, safe composability of SQL bits. And it does that without losing anything from SQL or Postgres. There's an, there's an asterisk there. It's not, you don't get everything, everything, but it's very close to it, as we'll see. Uh, and it will not generate SQL that fails at runtime. There's another little footnote there, uh, but it's, it's pretty close. And we'll see that too. And it manages to do this with an API that is pretty simple. It doesn't annoy me. And it's, it, it gets to the point where it's fairly easy to debug the compile time errors and actually know what went wrong. They're not all easy, and you do have to understand some concepts along the way. But you don't get to the point where you have to peel layers and layers and layers off to understand it. You kind of only need to understand the layer just beneath you. Uh, and that's really the way that it should be. Uh, and it's abstractable with any, without any unnecessary type noise. If anybody's tried to abstract ever persistent and ask them to go, uh, all the type class constraints over every field that you have get very crazy very quickly. Um, and Opalai doesn't suffer from this, which is great. Uh, and it's easily ex uh, extensible to generate new bits of SQL if you need to do something weird or differently. Um, unfortunately, I'm not going to talk about that in the talk, but there is, an, there is a code. I've done a big tutorial and a big code example that works and is runnable. Uh, so you can go to that, and I implemented the now function for dates. Uh, and it's, it looks, it's really simple. It's actually pretty easy. I'll show you after if we have time. And I think that's super freaking cool. And I'm using it work it now. I'm really excited about it. Sean, will just, he just wants me to shut up about it. I keep saying, well, if we're using Opalai, this wouldn't be a problem. Uh, and he's getting really annoying. But with this talk, I'm aiming to spread this enthusiasm so it's not just me getting really excited about it in the corner. Uh, and hopefully give you enough understanding to jump in and give it a try. Uh, and I'm very happy for you to take my tutorial and bring it to Hack Night next week if you want to play with it, add some functions, or anything like that. Um, that's a perfect example if you want to hack on it and get more help. Uh, so feel free to ask me any questions or heckle me if I'm failing at either of these. Um, there are some tricky bits and you won't understand everything, but you should at least get enough understanding to not be afraid and jump in. Alright, cool. Uh, so I'm going to just take, I'm going to focus on the concepts. We're not going to learn everything. The tutorial will give you a better thing that's on GitHub. It'll step thing, through things nicely and show you all of the generated SQL. It got to a point where I couldn't fit it on slides anymore, so I stopped. Uh, but it's there. I'm not hiding anything. You can go see it on the uh, GitHub tutorial. We're going to skip over some details to keep things a bit neat. Uh, and yep, as I said, there's a longer tutorial for more information. Uh, and ideally, these slides are completely useless after this talk. I'm just up here to be excited and share this excitement. Theoretically, the, the tutorial is what you need afterwards. Cool. So let's move on to defining our schema, because that's really the base of anything that is going to deal with um, SQL. We need to define our tables. Uh, and let's move on to that. Everybody can see that. I checked it before, and it looked OK. But yep, I'll figure out how to make reveal zoom to the entire thing one time. Um, so we want to start off with this thing here, where we have a book, and we know it has two columns. This is probably the weirdest, apart from profunctors, this is probably the weirdest part about Opali, is you, is you define everything, you define all your data types with these little type holes, and it'll start making lots of sense later. Uh, so we, we're making a book, and we, it has two columns. Uh, it's got the ISBN to identify it, and it has a title. Pretty basic. 
Uh, and then we want to make lenses, because lens source makes Opelai even more awesome, so we're going to use that. Uh, so then, I should have copied that down. Uh, then we define the column types. Now when we're talking about column types, we're talking about what the type, what we're expecting the type to be in the database. Um, so here we're saying that the title is a column of PG text, and we have this weird thing here called the ISBN column that we're going to dig into later. Uh, and then we want to define the types that we expect to get out in Haskell. And here we have, oh, laser point doesn't work. Uh, we have the ISBN itself, because we've wrapped that up in a new type, uh, to say that it's a specific type of ID. Uh, and then we have the text. Now, if you want to see all the different types that Opelai already has defined, you could define your own, if, especially if you have your own enumeration types or any extended types in Postgres, which you can do. Uh, but all the, the stock standard ones are all defined in opali.pg types. So you can see all them. All right, so let's move on to the table definition. Um, we start off with just saying, hey, we want a table, uh, and it's made out of book columns. The only thing that we have to do boilerplate-wise for our data types in Opali is generate this make adapter and instance thing. It's a bit weird, we'll see it, we'll cover that in a little bit more. But that actually comes into play here, that's what's generated this pbook, uh, which we'll see a little bit in a little bit. But ignoring the profunctor stuff, which we'll get to, uh, we're saying that our book is comprised of two columns as we define in our data type, and we're saying that the ISBN is required on insertion and the column name is ISBN, the title is required and it's called title in the database. And obviously our table name is called book. All right, so it's looking at the records, they're a bit weird. It's like, why do we give a type parameter for each hole? That's a bit weird. Isn't that just a tuple? The answer is yes, but it's, it's, it's exactly the same, except it's a tuple with names. And actually having names for your columns when you're making queries is really useful. It makes the queries a lot easier to understand. You don't have to remember that it's column three. Uh, so tuples are exactly the same. Uh, and this is really useful when we start branching out and doing projections that aren't the entire table. Like if we want to just select the ID or the ID and something else, we can use tuples as an easy replacement for the data types that we've defined for books and whatnot. So here we've got A, B, we've got our types, exactly the same way. We can define the table in exactly the same way. Except instead of our P book product profunctor, we've got P2. Now, uh, that in product profunctors, there is a product profunctor, which we'll explain later, defined for P2 up to P26. So you can have one of these for tuples up to size 26. Uh, that part isn't going to make sense yet, but we'll get onto it. Ah, we'll get onto it right now. So what is this product profunctor? If we look at our p-book, it's this weird thing. It's this uh, p, which is a product profunctor, and then we've got our book. And this book takes two transformations. It takes a transformation, uh, a profunctor from A1 to A2, B2, B1 to B2, and then it returns a profunctor of book A1, B1, to book A2, B2. That's a tiny bit weird, and the, the tuple is exactly the same, except instead of having books, we've got tuples in each spot. That doesn't really make sense. Profunctors are weird, but if we think about the function hour is a profunctor, we can just think about them as transformations or functions from A to B and B1 to B2. So if we take our pbook and fill it in with two functions, one that times uh, multiplies the uh, number by two, and one that puts bar onto the end of the string, we get back a book prime, uh, which we get back a function from book prime int char to int char, and then if we run that, we'd get the exact transformation that we expect. So we take our book at two, we times it by two, we get four, and then add bar to our foo bar. So really, what we're using these product profunctors for is to layer transformations all the way do it through our nested structures. Our structures might have lots of holes in them, they might have four, they might have five columns, whatever. The product profunctor abstracts over all the different arities that we could possibly deal with, up to 26, 
um, and then we'll wire a transformation through each one of those bits. Uh, and this... Oh, let's get ahead. Uh, and there are many pro profunctors. There are many profunctors in Oberlei. We've seen the table definition one. We were just before built this bit up here. This bit here is actually building up a table definition. So this is a table definition. This is a table definition. And this this P two combines those two table definitions into a a high level table table definition for the entire tuple two. Uh, we, there's a profunctor for constant, which takes a, takes a thing of any number of holes and applies transformations to each of one of them to turn them into literals that you might find in, this, in the SQL. So you might take a, a text in Haskell land and turn it into a column PG text to have a literal string uh, in the query somewhere. There's, there's profunctors for running the query and getting the Haskell back out. There's profunctors for aggregates and many more. Really. The product profunctor concept is what Opali is built around. Uh, and getting that part really into your head, you won't get it in this talk, don't worry. Uh, as, you, as, you, as you understand that, Opali will start making sense. Um, cool. Uh, and there's a whole heap more of them. <coughs> Taking a step back. Uh, the new type IDs for columns, which we saw before, we saw this weird ISBN, which was a new type, rather than being a column in our table definition. Uh, because, because when we have primary keys and foreign keys in our tables, we want to join them. So we don't really, it's very unhaskell-like to just say, hey, I'm a pgint4, and then not really know what pgint4 you have to join, especially once you get to tuples. If you don't have a name in the type, you start losing the meaning of what that integer is. Uh, so wrapping all the IDs of your tables up in new types so that you can um, discern them at the type level is really useful. Now, unfortunately, this isn't a new type. This is a Java type. Uh, but the, really, the only reason why that's not a new type is because this thing here breaks when you give it a new type, which is annoying, but once they fix the temp template Haskell, it'll be fine. Um, so what this make adapter and instance is doing is making one of these product profunctors for our ISBN because how we need to treat this new type is we need to put the column inside it and we need to put the Haskell data type that we're expecting on the way out inside it as well. So we're going to need to transform inside that thing as well as inside our table. So we've got, we're layering these profunctors to transform everything from the in out. Uh, and as you can see here, looking back at this again, this is what this is doing here. So we're creating a table definition uh, of required ISBN, wrapping it up in our new type, and then putting that through the product, the product profunctor for ISBN. Cool. Uh, now the last thing to talk about with um, just the table definitions in general uh, is auto-incrementing IDs and default columns. You know that before the, uh, the, the uh, Type parameters the table actually have two type parameters. One is for the type of the columns that you expect when you're writing the uh, the row, and this is for when you're reading it back out. And the reason why this is useful is because now we can say that when we're inserting it, the ID is optional. Uh, and how that maps to our column type is that this person ID is now a maybe. So we have the ability to send in nothing. Um, to that column when we insert it and let the database generate that from a sequence or whatever it needs to do. Uh, it's not just sequences, you could do it for default values or anything like that. Cool. And the, the tutorial demonstration does this everywhere, so everything that has an order incremented ID, it'll be done like this. Cool. Uh, does any of that absolutely not make sense? Is it kind of sinking in? How does everybody feel? Are there any questions at this point? Because if that part's a bit weird, then the next part will make might make less sense. So you're saying it does use template Haskell already? It only uses template Haskell for generating the pro profunctor instance. Okay. Uh, and really, that's the only constraint on your data type, other than the fact that everything needs to be 
top parameterized because you need to transform everything. Um, and that's a fairly non-offensive uh, template Haskell too. Really, all it's defining is a way to go to a tuple and back. That's really all it's doing. Nowhere near as uh, onerous as what the uh, template Haskell for persistent does to data types, for instance. But otherwise, it's completely template Haskell free. There's no template Haskell in the DSL. It's just for generating those instances. Cool. <laughs> cool. Uh, but really, we're here to, to figure out how we create a database. That's really the interesting part. So let's get to it. Uh, to query a table, it's you just hand in your, your table definition to the query table. And that will generate a query that has every column in that particular uh, table. So it's, just, it's the equivalent of doing a select star. And this is exactly what the SQL looks like. This is probably not how you, you would write select star on the book table. Um, and really, this, this, is, it, this is like this because of how OpenAI is generating the, the queries in order to be absolutely correct and not break anything. Tom does make the, uh, the claim that no, the difference performance-wise between the query that OpenAI generates and the uh, query that you would write should be fairly negligible. And if it isn't, if the query parameter isn't optimizing that away, that's a bug. And you can file it with him, and he will try and fix it. Uh, so while this looks ugly, and it's not how you would do things yourself, you probably shouldn't be concerned about that uh, with all these other good things that you're getting from it, being able to glue things together and do nice things. Cool. Um, so really, we. We're touching on this thing that I talked about before. We're talking about columns as the basic building block for generating SQL. And it's, it really they, they, it represents a fragment of SQL expression that you can use um, for either restricting or projecting in a query. So you can't run a column, obviously, because it's just a fragment. Uh, but you can use it to glue together and build other expressions out of. So the types of columns that we have are obviously the reference to the column name itself. So when you select from book, you get all the references to those columns so that you can use them uh, in expressions. You've got literal values where you may take a piece of, you may take a string or a number and put a literal thing into the query. Uh, and you obviously have compound expressions. So a lot of the Boolean operators and any other operator, they take two columns or more than two columns and produce a new column. Uh, out of the combination of those, and have a type. So, obviously, the equality uh, operator in OPLI returns a column of PG bool. And then we have queries, uh, and a query really uh, represents a a whole bit of SQL that you can run. Um, it can return columns. It can return no columns. So you can have a query that returns unit. Uh, uh, if you so want to, if you make a query that filters or does something other than returning columns, it can do that. Uh, and it also can be joined to other queries. Uh, so we have we have the power of joining these together or running it, but the query is the bit, the minimal bit that you can actually run. Now running, uh, we have a thing from OpenAI called run query, and at, it, as it, at its simplest. All it is is a way to take a query of columns and then return you an I/O action that will return you the Haskell representation of those um, from the database. That's and as long as you give it a connection, obviously it needs to connect to the database. Uh, and then this weird thing, uh, which when you if you break it down, it's it is just a it is a Query runner is a way to run the query and go from columns to Haskells, because that's the conversion that we need to do from our database columns, uh, which don't actually contain any values, they're just SQL expressions, uh, and actually running the query and returning the Haskell values. Default is a bit, uh, it's, it's another type class on top of this, which allows OpenAI to pick the default, uh, the default query runner for those two combinations of things. Because uh, what this allows you to do is, uh, there is a run query explicit that you pass the query runner in yourself. Uh, so this default is just picking out the 
the magical one that is normally what you want, and if you need to do something explicit, you can use the different one. Uh -huh. uh. <laughs> and Query Runner is a profunctor, so it's interacting with all the product profunctor stuff that our template Haskell generated. Cool. So let's do some run query in in the in the wild and see what it looks like. Uh, so if we run query with a connection uh, and uh, put in our query table, a book table, uh, noting that we have these columns here, uh, so our ISBN is a PG int eight to be long enough to hold the thirteen digit number, uh, and our ISBN column uh, and our book title is a PG text, uh, and then we say that we need to convert this to a Haskell data type, which the ISBN creates is uh, in 64, and the title is represented with text. Uh, so because these two um, type class instances are defined, a query runner column default of PG int 8 to in 64, and from PG text to text, the magic of the query uh, the, name of it, the query runner uh, is that it can glue all those individual definitions of going from PG into 8 and in 64s and text to text in your product profunctor and glue them all together and do all the wiring without a lot of boilerplate. You don't need to write an individual parser for your book. There just needs to be a, a runner for int 8 to in 64 for that to work. Which is really neat because you don't have to repeat yourself a lot, and the t the template Haskell is really simple because it's not doing a lot. It's using the power of profunctors instead. And if you want to see all of these definitions of the query on a column defaults, uh, if you look at OpenAI internal run query, you'll see all the instances for that. Uh, because if you ever get an error of I can't find the query runner for this type to this type, uh, then it's probably because one of these instances is messed up or you've messed up your query entirely. So it's always handy to go to this and figure out what you're doing is actually going to make sense or not. Cool. Uh, does that make sense? Cool. Uh, restriction. Uh, really, if we could only do select star, it wouldn't be very useful or composable. Uh, so let's move on. We've got this weird proc single tuple arrow do thing. Ignore that for now. Also ignore this weird looking do syntax. Uh, what this is really saying is we're selecting all of the books and putting it into B. Uh, and then we want to restrict those books uh, based on the ISBN that we found in the column reference. So we're comparing the column reference to the literal piece of text that is in this ISBN column. Uh, and then we just want to return. We need to return that book. So we return all the books that match. And this generates the SQL that you'd, you'd expect. Obviously, this is done with a, uh, a ISBN already filled in, but it selects the things that you want out. It selects both book columns. Uh, and then it says the ISBN is equal to that. Uh, we'll get back to the arrow stuff. Uh, for now, just if you think of it just like do uh, and monadic binds, it's going to make sense until it doesn't and you realize that's a lie. But by then you'll understand it enough that it won't really matter and everything will make sense anyway. Cool. So we don't just want to restrict. In SQL we can also project. Uh, so we don't necessarily want every column um, from the books, uh, especially if we've selected by ID. We already know what the ID is. So we can just return the title. This query isn't doing that. Probably should. but. Uh, if we remove the restriction and just select our reference to book title, then we get what we expect. We just select the title out. And then this column here, this query here, is just returning column PG text, so it's no longer related to book at all. Which unfortunately means you don't know where that text is from anymore, right? And that's why the new types really make, start to make sense. Uh, especially with the IDs and when you want to join them to other things. You don't want to get them mixed up. Uh, cool. So joining, I mean, joining's the why we use SQL. We may as well be using a key value store if we're not going to join, right? Uh, so it is as simple as just putting two queries uh, in your arrow comprehension. So we select all the books. Uh, we have a sub We have a table off to the side which has all the keywords for that particular book. Uh, we can join to that. 
and we restrict joining the ISBNs of the satellite table and the book itself, and then we can restrict actually finding the keyword that we're after. Sorry, I should have explained that. This particular function is looking, it's looking for all books with a specific keyword. Uh, and then we return the books that match. Uh, this, yeah, that generates the query that you'd expect. These two, Opalai is smart enough to end these two restrictions together so you can do it nicely on multiple lines and not have it be completely ugly by just having an end that goes off to oblivion. Uh, and, yep, I don't think there's anything else. Oh, no, there. Cool. Um, but we were promised reusability. Uh, so let's, let's refactor that particular, um, that particular query. It would be nice to be able to write it like this, where we are just join, we're just calling this thing called book keyword join, and it takes care of the join for us, because we don't want to have to, every time we go off the keyword query, we don't want to have to do that natural join over on the ISBN. Uh, and we can do this, and this is where the arrows start coming into it, uh, and I'll, we'll explain it on the next slide. Uh, so what we do here is we create this book keyword join, and now instead of query, we've got query arrow, which is really just a way of saying that this is a query that takes an input. Uh, query is really just an alias for query arrow unit, so a arrow with no unit, uh, no input. Uh, so we can take our, our book columns as an input, and do our standard comprehension of let's go over to keyword query, do the natural join that we want, and then re just return the projection of that keyword that we want. Because we already know what that um, ISBN is, we don't need to return it and duplicate that in the return. Cool, and then the, that PG text that we return gets assigned to K, which we can then use to restrict our general query. Uh, and that works exactly the same way, generates exactly the same SQL. And just belaboring the reuse point a bit, I mean, it goes even further. Really, oh. we can reuse things even further. So we can make another abstraction called book restricted by keyword, where the idea is that we pass in the keyword that we want, it goes off and does the join and restricts things by that keyword for us. So then we can clean this up even further. If we're doing lots of queries that are restricting things by keyword, we can reuse this bit and reuse this bit and not have to repeat ourselves over and over again. Uh, with very little, there's very little noise here, like you don't start getting lots of type class constraints or anything. You're just dealing with columns and query arrows. Uh, it doesn't explode on you, which is good. Um, and all this really means is that we have maximum opportunity to dry out our code in a safe way. Like we can reason that by pulling that out, it's going to generate exactly the same query, and it's not going to break, which is always nice. So what are these arrow things? Um, the main thing to take away is that the query generation is absolutely on purpose, not a monad. Uh, Haskell DB was monadic, and it generated bad queries because of it. Uh, that is probably the easiest thing to say, why arrows? Uh, but really, an arrow is just something that has an input, it has a body of stuff that does something, and it has the optional output that you can bind. Uh, and the thing to be careful of is that the outputs on the left-hand side, we go back to this guy here, the, the things that are bound on the left-hand side here can only go onto the to the input of another arrow. They cannot end up on this side of the the, that, the leftwards arrow. Uh, and as you start to abstract, that will bite you. And that's when you need to start making these query arrows that actually take input so that you can pass it in there because, yeah, there's just scoping issues to arrows. Because the idea of an arrow is that it's a lot more linear. Instead of this monadic thing which folds all the way down the spine of the tree, arrows kind of go from there to there to there, branch out, but then come back in. So it's, it's, a different, it's a different effect, and not having the ability to just infinitely join queries on top of each other, I think that's why 
the monadic stuff didn't work. But I don't know enough of that. I just know monads don't work, arrows. And really when we're talking about arrows here, we're talking about just having syntax with profunctors. I think Tony gets a bit angry and says, you don't need arrows, it's just profunctors. But the, the really, it's a, it's a very nice syntax for it to be able to do these kind of things. Uh, and it works pretty well. If you had to manually do all these linking together of all the transformations you were doing, it would be a lot less pretty, that's for sure. So thank you, Arrow Syntax. Um, cool. And yes, treat it like do notation until you realize that's a lie, but by that time, you'll know why it's a lie. Cool. Uh, so let's move on to insert. Insert's actually really easy. Uh, so if we're going to make a function called borrow, and we want to take uh, an accession ID. Accession is just, it's an instance of a book. So if you have two copies of the same book, they have two different accessions, but the one book. Uh, and you want to learn that to a person at a given time and a given due date, then you can make this happen by constructing the loan that you want to insert. Uh, and this here is what we're doing with the auto-generated IDs. We, don't, we just let um, Postgres do that. And we're using the constant uh, profunctor to transform our Haskell values into literals that can be in the SQL. Should come over here. Um, so here we have the loan that we need to insert. Uh, that's not too bad. And then we call lift insert returning, uh, which takes the table that you want to insert into. And it has a function that goes from the column type to the values that you want to return as the returning. So the, if you're not aware in Postgres, there's a returning thing that you can put on the end of selects. And it will return you the value so that you can get the default value that was assigned. Uh, because we want to return the loan ID here, right? So that's what we're after. And then because we know this is always going to return one thing, we do something bad and call head on it. Because it would have thrown an exception otherwise. So it's fine. More or less. Um, <laughs> cool. Uh, update. Update, if we want to if we want to make a function on the other side of that and we want to return a book, uh, we just want to take the loan ID that got inserted before and the time that we returned it. Uh, and then we need to write a function that looks like this. We're doing an update on the loan table and we need it to produce a PG rule column here of the filter condition. So we want to update every row that matches this which is exactly like a where condition. Uh, and then we need to do some, this function here is from the read column types to the write column types, uh, which you will see in a minute that that's a bit annoying, but it's okay. So we do a, we take our loan returned and we set it to be the constant of the return date. And then we have to do some unfortunate ceremony here for taking the existing loan ID and wrapping it up in a just, because if you put through nothing, it, yeah, it just the types don't line up afterwards. So you have to do that. And you can abstract that away into a different function. I normally do that of make the IDs happy for writes kind of function. Uh, and if you're not already aware, these functions are lens stuff. This is just set loan return to that. And this is, a, there's a function here that takes in the old loan ID and transforms it with that function. Very useful if you don't know Lens. Look into it, it's awesome. Cool, oh, and obviously this stuff here, sorry. Uh, this stuff here is also Lens. Uh, so that's taking our data type with our lenses defined on that data type. And it's just a, it's a lens to grab out the loan ID from that type. It's exactly the same as just calling, it's calling a function on there to grab it out, but it's just a bit nicer because you can compose them with other things. And, do nice lensy stuff. Sorry. But aggregation. Aggregation is why we do SQL. We can do lovely reports. We can group things. We can sum things. All those kind of things. It's really what makes me keen about SQL. I can write these ginormously dirty queries and throw them at a database and have it give me a result. Uh, for stuff that's actually quite difficult and tricky and annoying to do in code. So it's a great language for doing that. And we, really, if we're going to have an awesome DSL for SQL, we need to be able to do that. So let's start off with trying to write a function that for the, it will count the number of accessions 
so the number of copies that we have for a given ISBN. Uh, so we have a query here that will get us uh, every row here with the accession ID and the book columns for every row where that ISBN is equal. Now to count them up, we need to make another query down here that has this kind of shape. Uh, and we need to use that query that we, did, we built up here to select all the things that we care about. Uh, we only really care about the accession ID here. That's the thing that we want to count. So we're F mapping over that query. Now I think this is probably a good time to really hammer home that queries are not just arrows, they're not just profunctors, they are functors, they are applicatives. So there's, there's, there's other useful Haskell toolkit functions that you can use on them. You don't always have to reach for the arrow syntax, even though if you're joining or anything, it's usually very helpful. But if you just need to do something like this, which is changing a query of two columns to one column, fmap is fine. Uh, and then all we do is count those columns. Uh, it's as easy as that. And that will return, that now returns a query of column pgint8. Uh, if you want to see the, the sequel for that, it is on the GitHub. It's just too big to fit on a slide. So, uh, but, and if you want to see it afterwards, I can open up my terminal and show you as well. But it, that is really cool. But we can take that a step further. Obviously, we want to group by. So instead, let's write a function that for every accession, let's, let's count the accessions that we have for each keyword. Maybe we want to count how many programming books we have and all that kind of stuff. So we start off with a query uh, that does that. It's the exact same query as before. Should have just reused that. Oh well. Um, so we select all that. It's got the keyword in it as well. Uh, so we select the keywords and the accession IDs that we care about. Uh, and then we use our product profunctor to take these two aggregations and apply them to the so we group by on the keyword, and we count the accession IDs. Uh, and then, because we want to be fancy, we'll order by the counts descending. Uh, and that's, that's as simple as it, that's as hard as it gets for taking a query, aggregating by two columns, and then ordering it by the count result. That's pretty awesome. And it does that with complete type safety. So there's no way here that you can generate a query that is referencing a you can't do anything up here that is going to reference a column that doesn't that hasn't been grouped by or do anything crazy like that. Every 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 column that you reference after this aggregation has to be part. Everything here that you reference has to be part of this aggregation. You can't grab out any of these references down here and make a query that breaks. And that's where the arrow stuff really starts to kick in, because there's no possible way for you to pass a reference to the query in here to something up here. Uh, and that's, that's where that power really comes from. Um, and just knowing that that's always going to work with the thread of data is assuming that you've got the stringly type things for your tables and your columns and the scheme is even rough. Uh, we'll come to that later with my complaints. Uh, cool. So let's take it a step further. Pagination. Everybody does pagination. If you don't, your app's probably slow. Um, <laughs> Uh, and we, pagination is the same for every query that you do, and especially when you're in the raw SQL kind of mindset, that hurts because you're limiting and offsetting every freaking query, and it's not very fun. Well, it's such an awesome thing, we should only need to write once, right? Well, that's correct. So let's define some inputs and whatnot. Uh, we just define a data type for our pagination. So if something that's going to ask for a paginated query is going to give us a page number, and what with it wants. We make some lenses because lenses are cool. Uh, then we define a pagination results thing where when we return our query, we're returning what page it was on, what the width was given, what the max page is, and what the rows are. Uh, and then we derive some functor instances because that makes it useful later in lenses. Um, cool. So we wanted make some really nice, juicy, reusable SQL bits from this. And really, it turns out that we only need two things. We need a way to limit an offset, and we need a way to count all of the results in a set. So limiting and offsetting a query is really easy. You offset it, and then you limit it. Compose them together, uh, and 
does the thing that it needs to do. Uh, for any query, it doesn't care. Uh, obviously, because what it needs to do is put something onto the end of it. Um, and we need to count the number of rows that there are uh, in the entire query. Uh, so to do this, we actually need a column reference. So we need to get passed in a function of what column we want to count, which is fine. It's still nice and abstract. So we, we take our query, we project the ID out of that, and aggregate our count over it, which gives us the query of the number of rows in the entire set. Now joining these together is, uh, is surprisingly simple. So we take our two bits, we make our pagination results, which that's a function that's off to the side. You can look at it in the tutorial. All it does is basically count the, how many pages there are. Boring stuff that doesn't need to be on a slide. But it takes the p, which is the pagination input, and it takes the count and the results and makes the pagination results. So to do that, it needs to run that count query on the get ID that it's passed in and the query. Uh, and then it needs, needs to make a new instance of that query that is properly limited and offsetted and save the, that uh, list of things into the pagination results. Uh, and there we have it. It's pretty easy to apply to something because we can take a, we can take a query that just looks like this. It's pretty... Oh, copied it and pasted that like a fool. Pretend this was the old query and that's an array of books. Um, that was the old query where we're just passing in the books with keyword query, uh, passing in our text. Uh, but to paginate this search now, all we need to do is run that exact same query and then pass it through our pagination with the additional thing of passing in a way to select a column out that it needs to count. And that's as simple as that. You can do that for every query in your database. Not all of them are going to perform perfectly with that. There's some that you may want to restrict the inner query rather than the entire query. And there's a few things where it's not going to work out so well. But in general, that, that, that's going to work for most tables. And these little bits here are simple enough and easy to reuse on the little innards of your query that you need to specialize. Uh, so you should be able to take these, even if you can't use pagination, paginate, then you'll be able to pull these apart and make your own uh, with fairly low um, copying of stuff. Cool. I've talked about how awesome it is or tried, uh, but there are a few bits that will probably make you angry, uh, and I think this kind of talk is important to talk about those two. Uh, and really, the, the biggest chance of failures is when your schema doesn't match your database at all. And currently, there's no way to, to know that unless you've just run every query. Uh, there's no, there's, it would re really benefit, and maybe it's something I should write, but a, something, that you could, uh, something that you could run at the boot time of your application to throw every table in your database in your program at and just make sure that all of those queries actually validly prepare against the database. Because then you could check that all the columns are, names are right and all the tables are right. Uh, that naive approach wouldn't uh, solve columns that are completely missing, so maybe there's a better way of doing that, but... Hmm? So long as the scheme is correct, then the SQL is going to be correct, right? Correct. Okay. But if you typo one of the column names, you should have tested it to the point. But if, yeah. if you haven't migrated your database or something, things will catch fire. But to detect those problems, you don't have to prepare on every query statement you're doing it. You just have to check the schema the definitions you have against the table the definitions you pull out Postgres. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. I mean, can you generate Postgres create statements? No, and, that, that, that's, and that's the problem. There's no migrations built right. into so. OpenAI. So there is no way to. For OpenAI to say your database isn't at this schema, so let's make it happen. Both of them your ground. Yeah. 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 So you just have to make sure they line up. That's that in the scheme of things, it's okay. But it would be nice to really, really, really know that the database that you're running against has that exact schema when you boot up. Uh, dates. You'll quickly run into problems with dates. Uh, there's just there's really just not a lot of, of the operators written around dates, uh, and there's no reason why they can't be written. It was you could write you could write the now function in two lines of Haskell. It's just that they're not there, and you'll quickly run into problems with 
there's no now, there's no date trunk, there's no intervals. You've only got the, the timestamp TZ, the timestamp and date, uh, and time of day as well. So there's a few things that I, I tend to do with crazy date queries that just aren't there in Opal R yet. Uh, and you, you can't compare timestamps to dates like you can in SQL without ugly casting. So it really feels like there should be some type class magic like they have with numbers. So you can you can go int dot greater than double in OpenAI because there's a type class called PG Ord. Uh, and really, I think just the timestamps, the date stuff needs similar type class magic to kind of do those coercions for you in the Haskell type system. And I have started hacking together a prototype, and it's not impossible. It's just Require some thought that I don't think uh, Tom has put in there yet. Uh, Varkar links. You can easily screw up your inserts by inserting a piece of text that's too big for the database. It'd be really nice to have that encoded in the type somehow. Uh, it feels it feels like a falling down of the types that we have. But I don't know. I don't have any ideas that wouldn't be annoying like the new type wrappers. So I guess you pick your poison there. Um, but as long as you're careful with that and validate them, but really, I think your schema should know how big your table is and do some stuff. Um, the new types, as we saw, they're a bit clunky, it's a bit weird, it really forces you to understand the profunctor stuff because you have this extra layer that none of the tutorials talk about. Um, but I think for the, the, the benefits that you get from being able to return these IDs out of projections and know what the hell they are and make sure that you're not joining a Loan ID to a book ID. Can someone answer that? It'd be pizza. Hello. Um, so I think the, the new types are, are definitely worth it. They just could be nicer. Um, one problem that I've hit is that because thing because queries are so easy to compose, and you can just go off to this table and this table and this table. You can uh, introduce pretty hideous cardinality bugs pretty uh, pretty severely, because you can go you can say go off to the keyword table and forget that it's a one to many relationship and then suddenly explode the number of rows that you have. Um, there's a really cool aggregator called array ag, which aggregates things down into an array of things for that one to many. But you just have to be careful of it, and it's I, you have to be careful with SQL as well. Uh, just like you have to make sure you always join on the foreign keys and stuff like that, otherwise you do stupid stuff. But it would be, it just, it's easy to do accidentally because things are so easy to glue together. So it'd be nice to have a concept of like relationships and joins somewhere that was documented in types. But I wouldn't want that at the expense of making the API hideously more complicated. If you gave me that and something that looked like persistent, I'd be, I'd be upset and want to go back to OpenAI. But if there's a nice way to do that without sacrificing the simpl simplicity of OpenAI, I'd be all for that. Uh, and DB is other than Postgres. Uh, it only does Postgres. There is a experimental SQLite generator that's happening, but why would you do that? Just, just don't do that. Use Postgres. Uh, it's awesome. <laughs> we use it for everything. I if I want to lose half my data, I use Mongo. Yeah, you can do that, but there's no joins in anyway, so you're screwed. Um, so let's wrap things up. Let's talk for an hour. So, OpenAI is cool. It's SQL without losing any of the valuable parts of SQL. And it composes awesomely and safely. Because uh, there really aren't many ways that it can go wrong at runtime when you compose these together, bits together. And don't do silly things. Like, there are ways to do unsafe coerce and write your own. Um, Pyramid of generating things that can break, but as long as those bits are principled and used in the right ways, then you're fine. While you have to learn profunctors along the way, I'd argue that it's not it's not an insurmountable task. It's a bit weird at first, but if once you get in there and get your hands dirty with it, it starts making sense really quickly. Uh, and because I've done the hard work, I'm happy to help people through it. At, Hack Nights or one IRC or anything. So I'm excited about it, and I hope that you are too. Uh, because I think even if you don't use DBs, if you're one of those people who's like, I'm too cool for DBs and I 
do compilers or something like that. It's still an awesome example of how awesome and useful Haskell can be for a particularly messy and ugly problem. And it, to do it with such simplicity is just really cool. And it excites me even though, even apart from the fact that it gives me something really useful that helps me do my job. Cool. I think that's the end. Code and tutorial uh, is on GitHub once I make it not private. Uh, if you go straight to the slash code thing, there's a big readme that steps through basically this entire talk with some additional funky bits in there and all the generated SQL and just more details. So you should be able to follow that where I spoke really crappily and you might be able to figure it out from the words. Uh, and the slides will be up there, but I don't know how useful they'd be given that the, the tutorial does that for you. Um, the code should be runnable. All you need is a Postgres database and a Cabal sandbox install. So any questions or comments or anything? Pizza's here, so I think we did fairly well for time. Yeah, what's up? Uh, does it do, um, does it support things like, is it uh, the windowing stuff that uh, in Postgres? Um, no, you could, if you had the, you could probably write your own. Because essentially all the columns and stuff are, is things that generate a AST of SQL. So you could, you could probably roll your own. It's fairly extensible in a nice kind of way. Some of the query runner uh, column default instances are a bit gnarly to write because they there's layers and layers of profunctors that you have to get down to before you do any work. But does the laziness ever make it a little bit surprising as to where it's hitting the database? Uh, no, because, the, and that's the coolest thing about it, that the, the query generation is absolutely pure, and there's nothing weird about that. You pass, you pass the query to the run, and that's what goes and does it. There's nothing touching the database about doing your arrow compositions, which is really cool because it means the generation of the queries doesn't have to do any random number generation to generate unique uh, like column names or anything like that. That's all done by the query runner. So, when you're when you're building these arrows, all you're really doing is making a tree of profunctor arrows from the, the starting table all the way to your end result, and that's the whole thing about these transformations is the magic of it all, because you're going transformation, 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 transformation to something that will return a Haskell type, and then the runner goes and executes that. Never going to actually go and do some partial. No, absolutely not. Even if you're using pieces, it's all the constructor queries. Yeah. Which also means that it has a lot of a lot of good stuff in there for being able to optimize the SQL and play around with it in yeah. principled ways. Pagination, you know, hold on to the pagination at the time you asked for it and be stable even if someone else is writing the database? Uh, no, because that, all that's doing is limiting and offsetting. Okay. You'd have to layer that on top yourself. Yeah. Okay. But that's the good thing about OpenAI. All of its business is making the SQL. Yeah. Everything else on top is your magic. On top, yeah. How would you compare it to Slick to use in production? Oh, much better. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't say fault my JVM. That's the point. That's really nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's just the types are a lot easier. You don't have to dig down so much of the API to understand what's going wrong, and just the the inference is a lot nicer because all you're doing is dealing with columns to columns and building up SQL. There's no other information being carried by the DSL. So. Do you have any Haskell that say false from JVMs? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you, have you ever encountered a case where it generates SQL that the that Postgres can't actually analyze and uh, give you a result? Because I've done that with my with MySQL generated MySQL. It's so complex that MySQL can't, even though it's correct, MySQL can't analyze it. It's too big. The string is too large. Ooh. I've never hit that, but um, my queries aren't super duper ridiculous. But yeah. I suppose that usually comes down to you just got to configure it differently because the systems administrators are just locked up way down. You have 20k of query optimizer memory, something like that, make it impossible to run everything. But I think Postgres, there's no real upper limit. You just drag the sliders all the way up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Admittedly, I don't know what the MySQL instance I'm running on, what that's configured to. So that's, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what I've run into with generating generating SQL from some higher level um, 
and in that case, it's um, doing time series analysis, which is a, I know a lot a lot bit easier to do in Postgres. Yeah, with windowing functions and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah you have to write you have to write your own that you know a nice drill and it blows things out. Yeah, although we're going to influx anyway soon for that kind of stuff because it's it's cool. Any idea how long Tom was hacking on this? I knew it was in the wings for a while. But... Yeah, I have no idea. It seems to. It, he, I think, when he released the hackage, it had already been used for a year, yeah. like in his production. So I have no idea. But it, it's sourced from Haskell DB, and Haskell DB hasn't gotten a lot of love yeah. in a while. So because that, yeah, I first came to Haskell, I'm like, Haskell DB, awesome. This might be better than Slick. No, I just, it just it rubbed me the wrong way. But this is an awesome refinement of that, and it works perfectly. Sort of following on from um, the previous question of can you build quite hugely complex SQL that just breaks the DB? Mm -hmm. If it did become necessary, is there a convenient way to write a custom SQL and then translate well, that to the Well, the awesome thing about this is that all it's doing is sitting on top of Postgres simple. So the connection that you're using to pass into the query runner is exactly what you use to pass to Postgres Simple to do your own raw query. So there's always the escape hatch of Postgres Simple. But is there something convenient of the program just to do the type translation back on what you get out of Postgres Simple? No, you're going back to... Because to Post, Postgres Simple has that stuff built into it. It has from rows and from fields. So yeah. there'd be no reason for okay. yeah. Opalite to redo that. And the types in Postgres Simple are obviously different to Opalite because Opalite is building SQL, it's not dealing with actual values. Cool. cool. Thank you.